Bonsoir à tous. Good evening, good evening to all of you. Christian de Boisseau my name. I'm an economist, vice president of the Cercle des Economistes. Uh, I have the a hard duty, difficult duty to facilitate the last session of the day on a quite a hot topic that is how to preserve Africa from a debt crisis. No question mark. That is, we consider that by selecting the theme that there is an issue here. Uh, which has to do with African debt. And uh, I have three panelists with me, brilliant panelists, who will enlighten us. Just a quick word about each panelist. In Cape Town, with us in video conference, Professor Carlos Lopez, who occupied major position in the United Nations, is also a university, um, an academic, and is a high representative of the uh, Commission of Union Africa, African Union for the Partnership with Europe. Then, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Okamura, who occupied major position in Japan. Uh, who is a major uh, expert on Africa. He was an ambassador in, uh, in uh, Ivory Coast and is now Japanese ambassador to the EOCD. Last but not least, Dr. Mario Pezzini, who was uh, an academic, nobody's perfect, uh, you know, as a teacher, I can say so, and uh, I'm still a teacher. And Mario, you joined the EOCD in 1995, and you never left it, and you are the manager of the EOCD Development Center, which plays a key role in uh, or for the dialogue between North South countries, developed countries, emerging countries, and so on and so forth. So those are the three panel members, and I will give Give them the floor in a minute. My role is not just to replace the journalist who cannot be with us tonight, but I want to say a few words about the topic. So, the Africa debt crisis and how could we avoid a shock? Uh, several of you have asked questions. We'll come back. We'll come to the questions uh, when once the three speakers have delivered their notes. First comment. 2020, Sub-Saharan Africa, like the rest of the world, will face a recession or downturn. So I'll took the, the reflection of the IMF for 2020 for the Sub-Saharan Africa. The uh, growth will be minus 3.2. And a slight uh, upsurge uh, next year at 3.4. So those figures are not as bad as we'll, what we will face in Europe. In Europe, it will be minus 8, 9, 10, possibly below that. But now, for Africa, it's not good news. Let's face it. Africa is in the crisis, and the crisis is in Africa. So there is no uh, island that will protect, uh, um, to protect it from the rest of the world. So, so for the last few years, this months, there was a drop in the demand for raw material. And this is where we see a go straight into the debt crisis because the drop in the uh, raw material crisis causes financial issues. And my feeling is that what producing countries lose with the loss in raw material price is not uh, gained by the importers. It's not a no zero-sum game. And the, uh, it's bad news for Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa in general, and for the, their uh, finances. Another comment, when we look at the evolution of uh, debt in Africa, of debt in Africa, well, it has increased significantly in absolute value and in percentage of the GDP of the countries. I'm talking about Sub-Saharan Africa because today the debt of Sub-Saharan Africa is slightly more than 50% of their GDP. Ten years ago, it was 30, some 30%. 30 Clearly, there is a high amount. There is a change of uh, debt with the uh, increase of China. China is now holding about a third of the Sub-Saharan uh, debt. This debt uh, amounts to $360 billion. And a third of it, about 220, uh, covered by China. And China is also facing a crisis. So uh, clearly, this uh, context is changing the relationship between China and Africa. Third comment on the debt. 
increase of private debt. Now, this is key when we look at the evolution. 10, 15 years ago, the African debt was mainly a debt uh, uh, of sovereign state. It is now 40% is a debt uh, to of uh, private uh, players, investment fund, and other private operators. So it's not a problem as such, but it means that the interest rate is cry is increasing. And uh, what we need to discuss the financial analyst markets clearly are not helping Africa and are not being uh, and they ask for interest rates which are clearly too high. Last comment and then I give the floor to the end the guests. I believe that to deal with the problem of the uh, Africa debt is to uh, discuss the finance general financing of African economies and we'll have to discuss the problem of public and external debt you know and the borderline being fairly blurry when it comes to African countries. And we'll have to discuss this problem of debt in uh, African countries in the problem of general financing of those economies. So G20 in March uh, in the corona um, gave us some sort of a 12 months delay to for African countries saying 12 months we you don't reimburse and you will uh, you reimburse later on. Um, then they will they also want to uh, cancel part of the debt. When I talk about uh, funding. And I think we'll have to come back together to this you know, the financial uh, solution for Sub-Saharan Africa, the uh, household saving, formal, informal, and all the mode of funding, uh, my financial markets, and so on and so forth. With no further ado, I will give the floor to the uh, farthest uh, member of the panel, Carlos. Carlos, I give you the floor seven to eight minutes. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction. Now, first and foremost, I want to mention the fact that if we are talking now about debt, the African debt, it's not because of COVID, even though COVID uh, doesn't help and is certainly going to uh, further deteriorate the situation and increase the vulnerability of the African economies. But the problem of the debt is associated with many uh, narratives, images, discourses, and even myths. Uh, uh, which need to be clarified or corrected first. Indeed, do African countries have a debt ratio versus GDP, you say 50% for the time being, which is uh, excessively negative, and it is so in as much as there are problems of uh, uh, service debt pay reimbursement in the systems used by the various institutions like IMF on the ability of country to reimburse, you know, to, to pay that, you know, to pay back the debt. Well, they take into account not only the ratio, but they also take into account the share of public resources is dedicated to debt reimbursement. And African countries indeed are face needs because their fiscal rate is very low. Uh, you know, some of the lowest in the world. And of course, it uh, uh, consumes a lot of the resources which could be used for other uh, uh, state needs. But this tax pressure increases uh, year by year on. And, uh, and there's been an increase since 2000. But despite this, African economies still suffer from a problem, major problem, and now nobody wants to acknowledge the fact that uh, the uh, rates applied, uh, employed by international institutions are available for a very limited part of the capital necessary to, for, to such economies, uh, which do not have access to the capital market, uh, and therefore rich countries usually have access to the capital market around 40, 30, 40 percent. In Africa, it's less than 5 percent. But we do have a problem that is in uh, at the um, the capital doesn't make, follow the same trajectory as the size of the uh, the economies. The G combined GDP of Africa uh, has more than doubled since 2000, but the ca uh, capability in uh, resources has uh, increased by. Uh, 15%. So countries have to go and get 
money uh, finances where there exist two doors are open uh, the door you mentioned that is basically loans uh, you know trade loans or commercial loans where they uh, they're, they're like penalizing because you know uh, there is no justification because we have the best return on investment and because uh, there is an exaggeration of the risk and we see it for example right now with covid or with exogenous factors we see that uh, this is uh, penalizing Africa, but not at the same level of uh, other parts of the world. Or we have to look for loans, bilateral loans, and there China is clearly uh, more the, the, the one available and which provides the best conditions. So we end up in a situation, and this is quite COVID-like or COVID-associated, where uh, where countries are pre-COVID, sorry, uh, countries have, have access to sovereign debts at a very almost constitutional rate because there's sometimes negatives in some countries around zero percent. And it, the, it's the poor African countries uh, which have to pay very high rates for this sovereign debt because they cannot get uh, constitutional funds. So it is a paradoxical situation and the COVID is just increasing it. So with COVID today, we are experiencing exceptional situations. And uh, what we could expect is that a certain number of measures to compensate for the African difficulties. And what was announced, what has been announced, and we'll be able to discuss it possibly in the coming hour, is uh, very minimal when we compare this to the need of this continent. We are talking about suspension of uh, reimbursement of the debt as uh, or cancelling the, the reimbursement of debt as the G20 said that but when contribution comes it's about 12 billion US dollars it's less less than one the uh, uh, European Union we give to Portugal with 10 million inhabitants so just to give you an element of comparison so those are minimal uh, uh, efforts and still the African public debt is being treated as if it was like a, a sort of a, a small phenomenon associated with the African way of managing funds or finance. The problem of public debt is a global problem. It is a problem far more serious in the um, rich countries, but they can afford uh, political uh, mon monetary policies not accessible to African countries. So do stop treating Africans as if they were poor managers and let's deal with them in a more systemic approach where we have the opportunity to discuss the, the IMF condition which should change and clearly there will be opportunities that would be provided on the table. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, Carlos, dear Carlos, you'll take the floor again later on and you were straight on time i will now turn to his excellency ambassador okamura thank you for being with us again and i give you the floor for seven eight minutes Merci. Uh, je suis très... yes thank you i'm really honored to be here well uh, you might wonder why there's a japanese diplomat amongst uh, amongst uh, the panelists when discussing africa uh, about the matter of the debt. Well, debt in itself is not a bad thing. It's a source of investment, investment for the future, and financing for n useful things. But why? Uh, Every time there is an economic crisis, we talk about African debt. Why? Mr. Carlos Lopez has mentioned vulnerability of the economic system that causes uh, African, uh, Africa's debt, but I think there's a cultural and social aspect. 
Uh, Japan, you know, is involved in African matters through the uh, TCAD, Tokyo International Conference on African Development. And since the 90s, Japan has forged a partnership through the uh, TCAD conference. When did it all start, that conference? Be because Asia was used to be a poor country, prone to conflicts and uh, non-democratic regimes. But in the 90s, Asia, and in particular South Eastern Asia, has developed uh, greatly from an economic perspective. Africa uh, then called upon Japan so that it, they would extend their development and cooperation policy to the African continent. And now, over the, it's been 25 years since uh, Japan has started working with Africa, and we've observed that Africa presents a specific problem. And just in a word, in a few words, Africa is very close to Europe, geographically and historically. And Africa tends to be too dependent on Europe. So that there's the idea that Europe should give them and teach them things. But in Asia, it's different. Maybe some thought that by photocopying the European model, that would help solve uh, African problems. But that is not a, uh, or superimposing a European model could suffice. But uh, this is not a, a solution that adapt is adapted to Africa. Africa and a lot of African countries have uh, remarkable um, social systems. And why not use them? Asia has uh, proven able to use European models so as to uh, nurture its uh, uh, development. And uh, so that is the uh, question of mindset. Uh, so the heart, historically and, geogra and geographically, um, uh, of Africa is in Europe. They send uh, their children to the Sorbonne uh, to study. When they are ill, the elites go to European hospitals to get care. Why do they not uh, aim for excellence in their own hospitals? So having faith in these countries, and in their own, in, in, in themselves and in our own continent is essential. So this is a deep-seated problem Borders are artificial, and building national identity amongst uh, such varied populations is not uh, easy. Modern state is a relatively recent concept. It is necessary to rebuild this faith in nation, public order, the public administration, And these administrations are based on fairly fragile systems currently that don't always work. And COVID-19 crisis has uh, uh, highlighted these weaknesses, in particular in public health. When I was in Japan in 2018, I gathered uh, five former African presidents, President Shisano from Mozambique, President Mukapa from uh, Tanzania, 
Prof president um, Becky from South Africa, the, uh, form the former Nigerian president and the former Benin uh, president, to try and look into how we could help bring prosperity and stability in Africa. We've had some very good uh, discussions, and they all shared my observations. And at uh, TCAD 7, that took place in August 2019, a prime minister came up with a new approach for peace and stability in Africa. NAPSA is the acronym. This is based on two principles. First, empowerment, taking ownership. It's for Africa to be in the driver's seat, to uh, drive their uh, own countries towards their future. Also, to fight what um, prevents peace and stability. To that end, strengthening institutions and governance. So institutions and governance are sometimes very weak. They need strengthening. If they were strengthened, new institutions uh, could contribute to the safety and well-being of the population and faith in the nation could be uh, rebuilt. To that end, it is, is uh, really uh, crucial to tap into the strength that is present in the population, in the local communities, villages, religions. These populations that were deemed by some to be backwards um, and to have uh, uh, been deprived of uh, enlightenment. But they have their own ethics, their own justice, and respecting them is the way towards building a new system of governance for these populations. And democracy could uh, uh, develop in African style. There's the notion of consensus that is uh, very important. Discussions can go on for days before reaching consensus. Uh, under the uh, mythic tree under which all these conversations are held. So we could even say that uh, it can be a source of uh, uh, the presidents and the all-powerful president can be a source of instability. Parliamentary style might be more adapted to African countries. Even in that presidential regime, it could be possible to build dialogue with the different uh, organizations within society and different uh, opposition movements. If the people could be united, a lot of problems could be overcome. That is really the key. I'll stop here and I'll come back to the question later on. Thank you very much. So, uh, dear Mario, over to you and many thanks for being with us. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. A lot of things have already been said. So, um, I'd like, if I may, to sum up uh, uh, my opinion in two points. There's the situation that Carlos Lopez that uh, mentioned, the situation pre-COVID, uh, the situation in which a lot of African countries uh, had had remarkable uh, results. Uh, average growth rate has been 4.8 uh, uh, per year. Only Asia did better. Latin America was around 2.6. Uh, so that tells us a lot. There were uh, significant phenomena, such as the, that uh, uh, a great part of that growth came from the domestic market, so that there was an endogenous uh, capacity for growth. And there's a, a, a number of uh, uh, banks and institutions that found a place in uh, the uh, international economy. 
uh, free trade uh, uh, also um, um, was flourishing. And uh, so uh, it had to be admitted that there was a, a, a drive for growth. And uh, uh, it is difficult for all countries to follow a, uh, a dedicated path towards growth. And it was also true for uh, Africa. There was a, a bottleneck effect that uh, required to, uh, a lot of investment. What can be done? Carlos reminded us the increase in debt was linked to the need for investment. And uh, what followed was uh, efforts on the part of uh, uh, some partner countries, uh, amongst them European countries, that changed their uh, cooperation policy. Now it's called partnership uh, policy. Uh, so the terminology also uh, uh, is meaningful with uh, uh, investment from the private sector so as to mitigate the risks. Uh, is this fully used? No, not necessarily. Other uh, players uh, with um, uh, China the, um, and uh, the, uh, the decision on the part of the U.S. to make significant investment in uh, the African continent. And, uh, and there are other uh, partner countries. But all of that uh, was uh, happened with a certain degree of competition, and there needs to be consistency in that effort. Um, before the COVID crisis, where did the factors for growth uh, come uh, from? Average growth was 1.8 uh, in uh, uh, in, West, in the OECD countries. So there was a, a clear sign of decline. It came from emerging countries such, such as Africa. Their growth was a good thing for all. That coordination remains indispensable so as to have a partner on the path to development and growth, a partner that is uh, really a valuable one. And then came COVID. Uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, so we did the math. If the same measures had had been adopted in Africa as in Europe, the debt would go up by 80 percent. It's not such a huge figure. Uh, over, but I'm not sure of that uh, figure of uh, plus 85 percent, uh, be because it's not. Um, uh, a sure thing that uh, it's not uh, certain that uh, COVID will have a, a symmetrical impact on Africa. It could have an asymmetrical impact. We'll have to uh, see. But there's a uh, some uh, there are some international mechanisms that are transferred on uh, onto Africa. You've mentioned the drop in the price of raw materials. There's another thing, which is the uh, shrinking of demand um, for SARS consumption in Africa uh, had uh, gone down uh, by uh, three percent, uh, and demand has dropped in uh, Europe and in the U.S. Third, tourism. Tourism uh, is uh, almost gone in Thailand, in uh, uh, Cap Verde. And, uh, so as economists, we uh, sometimes think that this is not significant. When we look at the international flows that go towards Africa, the remittances from migrants are uh, pretty much the same level as uh, from foreign countries. We estimate that there will be a drop by 20% of remittances by migrants. So they've started to ask migrants to, um, uh, in some uh, European countries to go back to their uh, countries. Uh, that will also uh, reduce uh, that uh, amount. If there's a good social security system in these uh, countries, they will benefit from uh, these measures. But if there is no such thing as a good social security system or more of an informal economy, they won't be able to benefit. Uh, the uh, uh, UNCTAD uh, predicts that there'll be a uh, drop between 40 and 70 uh, percent. Um, 
so, uh, so COVID is going to prove to be a major disruptor. How can we react? Uh, fiscal uh, pressure, which is around 17% of GDP in Africa, is low. So there is a need for tax reforms, but when the situation allows it, but at the moment, we need to act to support uh, African countries and help them with their debt, which is not wholly due to themselves. All of the mechanisms that I mentioned are external factors. You can't um, uh, punish these countries for uh, having had crazy policies. That's not the case. It's uh, due to fa external factors to a, a great extent. How, how can we react? Uh, we can't really draw inspiration from the noughties because there's uh, capacity on the part on, on the part of creditors that has completely changed. China is a major player. Uh, uh, in 2009, China has become the uh, um, most important uh, uh, partner uh, for Africa. But in Africa, amongst African countries, you have situations that are different. Um, uh, those with uh, a uh, 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 medium income can tap into private uh, debt. Uh, those with lower income cannot um, call upon private debt. There's the question of interest rates and the, what the World Bank and the IMF do, that's important. We uh, should be grateful for them, but they're not enough. They're not sufficient. There's a need for other solutions. What am I thinking of? Um, we could set up a centralized fund in which uh, countries that are in the lead would be compensated, uh, countries that are in debt, sorry, would be compensated. But uh, there's a need for a mechanism to check on the risks of those developing, uh, con for, uh, in those developing countries. I agree with Carlos that this, um, uh, mechanism is very important because we underestimate the risks linked to debt in Africa. We need to check and we need a more uh, adequate mechanism. And we also need to uh, bring uh, other uh, international institutions. Those are my first observations. I'm back here, and I want to do. I want to proceed as follows. We have about half an hour to go, and thanks to our uh, auditors, uh, we do have questions that will do. will restart the discussion. And Carlos, who is not at the table with us, but he's in here intellectually. So, let me ask us the number of questions. I will mix uh, questions that uh, cropped up during the discussion and questions from the auditors. Uh, the listeners, and then I will ask uh, each uh, member of the panel to not to answer all the questions because we won't be able to do so, but to select questions you'd like to uh, insist on. Now, let me, I'm trying to mix questions from the speakers and questions from the, uh, so, the three of you, it seems to me, you said that it's more like that's uh, it's, it's like something that I find uh, striking, that many of the topics we are discussing did exist were pre-COVID, and uh, some were increased, uh, aggravated by the COVID crisis. It not all started in March this year, and uh, and uh, the topics we had we discussed they started before that. Now, among the questions, I mean, uh, in uh, Carlos, Carlos, what would be interesting is that Carlos, you said in fact decisions, G20 decisions in March, uh, three months ago, which gives some kind of a 12 months delay to 40 African countries, who uh, do not have to reimburse that debt for one year. You said it is necessary yet insufficient. And Mario uh, insisted on that as well by saying that the uh, multilateral uh, organisms like IMF and World Bank could help. Now, could you dwell on this a bit? And uh, should we go further in the uh, cancelling of the debt 
and uh, the role of the Paris Club, uh, Club de Paris for the, or the Club de Rome for the private debt, Club de Paris for the sovereign debt, are there margins for maneuver? That's my first question. Second question is to uh, uh, by one of the listeners, and this is in line with the specific effect of the COVID crisis. In your opinion, will the COVID crisis delay the possibility for African countries to go to further, deeper enter the world capital market. So it's a risk assessment or risk analysis by market analysts and so on. So on. Will COVID somewhat hinder the uh, access of African countries to capital market? Third question that you uh, do addressed, you said, well, in fact, financial markets analysts, we didn't mention the rating agencies, of course, the, but anyway, they are not very friendly with our African countries, uh, African friends, by over assessing the risk and under uh, assessing the, the, the rating. So. Where does it come from? Why so? Is it a heritage of history? Is this a problem of image, of reputation? Is it an exaggeration of the consequences of lack of transparency, corruption that may exist in Africa, but which exists everywhere, not just in Africa, everywhere? So what happens in the mind of the analyst of the market um, or the rating agencies to have to, to, so that they're not able to correct the, the image they have of African countries. Can we do something? Can we do something there? Fourth comment. Once one listener, well, all the questions come from, from the listeners, you know, are good, so I wouldn't be able to take them all, but one is very quite precise, which is as follows. Should we today do a kind of an audit about the African country debt and he has or she has an audit to assess the illegitimate part of the uh, debt because it needs to be defined what you call legitimate and illegitimate debt or official or unofficial or formal informal or cancel or cancel the, 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 the illegitimate part. Fifth question. We talked about the, prop, the issue of financial markets. You talk about fiscal tax reform as a way to mobilize uh, savings, uh, household savings or private savings through taxes and uh, to lower budgetary deficit and public debt. The concrete question I'm about to ask, if we, there is saving, private saving in Africa, there is private saving in Africa. First, it has to be kept in Africa. We don't want it to go to New York, to Switzerland, to Paris, to Frankfurt, or elsewhere. So it has to be kept in Africa by means of attractive financial products, by attractive tax incentives, by security, bank bank and financial regulations to ensure the safety of savings. What would be, in your opinion, the priorities to somewhat loosen the uh, pre financing uh, constraints to to have a better in, in, involvement or mobilization of the formal or informal uh, aspect of uh, savings and so reduce the, the call the need to call for external debt a uh, simple arbitration is needed between the uh, household you know uh, private saving and uh, uh, external debts now let me close with another question from a listener. A person says, if the interest rates uh, increase, will rise, Africa is not in zero go rating, you know, I mean, uh, is not in negative rates. So if the interest rate increase, says the, the, the listener, possibly 
this will attract more investment from China, even though China, uh, with a growth of 1% in 2020, will uh, less willing to uh, go to Africa when we got six percent when we when it had six percent growth. Of course, the slowdown in uh, in Af in China will have an impact. But if the interest rate increase, China will be more present. Now, how can we make sure that in order to uh, stop excess introduction from China, how could multilateral players could act to uh, not uh, prevent uh, China from entering the system, but to con contain it? I'm not exhaustive. We've got 20 minutes left. So back to Carlos first. And Carlos, you react to any of the questions which have been asked. And uh, the question I've just asked. Uh, asked 20 minutes left. Okay, seven minutes each, six, seven minutes each. Carlos, you're on. Thank you. Since the financial crisis of 2008-2009, we've been discussing issues of questions of principles when we talk about Africa, but we talk absolute uh, value when we talk about all the parts of the world. W let me explain. When, we come when it comes to the debt, public debt of uh, EOCD countries and of other parts of the world is st staggering. It uh, exceeds by, la by large the 5% of the GDP in, uh, in the case of uh, Japan, it's 200%. You know, uh, so we consider that uh, it's uh, we consider it's manageable because we put aside principles which are considered as a principle of good macroeconomic management. When it comes to Africa, we come we 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 ignore the principles. Now, the consequence of such an approach is that we are limited in Africa when it comes to monetary policy, and therefore we cannot manage the debt as the other regions of the world do what other regions of the world do, that they have uh, uh, recovery plans. These recovery plans may go to uh, se reach 7 to 8, 10% of the GDP. In the case of Japan, it's 40%, excess of 40%. In Africa, you can't, we can't do it because the way it is done is either by uh, you know, uh, run, printing out money and rating agencies would consider that we're poor managers or and of course, that they would be right up to a certain extent because our economy is considered, uh, is judged as a function of the externalities and uh, based on its domestic market. Therefore, with all the recovery plans we see going on today around the world, which reach 5,000 billion US dollar, talking about the African debt of 270, uh, 260 billion, uh, uh, 600 billion US dollar debt, it's ridiculous. It's nothing. But this is what we're doing because there are two, it's, it's an unequal rating, so unfair rating. So rating agencies uh, judge the poor macroeconomic policies, any limitation of capital transfer, that is the external aspect of our economy. And therefore, uh, just to give you an idea, an illustration uh, quite remarkable, the largest African company, Nasper, which is based here in Cape Town, uh, can transfer from the Johannesburg Stock Exchange to the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, as it did uh, five months ago. They can transfer $120 billion capital simply because they were better, they had better conditions in, uh, in, the, in the Netherlands than in South Africa. The explanation given for South Africa to stop preventing this, to stop this uh, 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 transfer uh, that the rating agency would punish it, and they've done it anyway. So clearly, we are uh, between two um, two stands. I mean, you did, uh, we cannot have a real monetary policy with certain independence, and for example, be able to manage crisis as the one we're experiencing with uh, recovery plans and so on and so forth. And at the same time, we are being punished because we are good uh, students and we follow the macroeconomic motto which is imposed upon us. So what would be the solution? Just to get to the solution. Solution would be to deal with the three 
aspects of debt in a different manner. We There is the debt to, uh, before the international institution, which is a constitutional debt, which could be treated uh, in a more lenient way, a more favorable way than the, the one proposed by G20. And that would help us, but that would not be sufficient because what we need is liquidity, cash. And in order to get liquidity, well, you have to rely on a change of behavior of the IMF. Without changing the rules of the IMF, we can increase the uh, disbursement or increase the quotas of countries or to touch the specific uh, money um, drawing rights, the drawing rights, sorry. So uh, we need uh, the uh, we need the, the approval of the approach. So we did it during the crisis in 2008, 2009. They did for several countries in Europe, Portugal, Cyprus, you know, and so on and so forth. So uh, at the time, they were considered as exceptional, uh, except, an exceptional uh, situation. And as Mario explained, we're going through an exceptional situation, and the factors that prevent Africa from uh, functioning are exogenous. It's not even the, the health crisis that, you know, did not actually reach dramatic situations in Africa. There are exogenous factors, and therefore, this uh, unfair treatment would be advisable and justified. And I have to say that the language of the IMF uh, management uh, is, is towards this. Uh, some countries actually are playing a dangerous game of applying specific principles to African countries that they don't apply to themselves. Second possibility, second uh, debt segment is the bilateral debt. And I think really countries can forgive part of that debt, especially for the weaker countries. And then there's commercial debt, which is the uh, biggest problem. Commercial debt, of course, we're not going to ask the private sector. to not want to make profit from what they've granted in terms of loans. But we can set up a sp specific vehicle, as it's been done in other circumstances before, to buy this debt, which is around 5% of interest rate, and could convert it to 1% to 2%. That is totally feasible if we have the guarantee from a number of powerful central banks, such as the European Central Bank. Or if it's not the case with the European Central Bank, a number of European countries could give that guarantee. And I think that these countries would benefit from this because that would get Africa uh, out of that uh, situation. It would be a renegotiation. It would not be uh, uh, equal to giving money. It uh, There would be a triple A rating that uh, African countries do not often get. But what we're talking about at the moment is ridiculous in terms of amount. All of the bonds for this year are around $44 billion. $44 billion is roughly three weeks' worth of the uh, of Japan's recovery plan or four weeks' worth of the U.S. recovery plan. So we're really discussing uh, very small amounts compared to the compensation that it could give to uh, and, and how it could contribute to uh, world balance. And just one word about China. All of the uh, Chinese investments and loans in China represent the same amount of what they grant to Pakistan. That's 4% uh, of their investments abroad. So those are very small amounts for China as well. And for geopolitical reasons, I think I don't think China is going to 
moderate its uh, mm, this momentum because the costs are very low and uh, the benefits are very high. We have 10 minutes left, so five minutes each. So Mario and the ambassador will have the last word. I totally agree with what Carlos uh, said. So uh, I would uh, leave these questions regarding uh, 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 debt service. But there were other questions that had to do with tax reform, Europe and China, and uh, what other countries could play a part. So let me use the few uh, minutes left uh, to me to say these. Uh, Pre-COVID, the situation um, was based on a forecast of 2.9 um, growth, uh, percent growth. And and, and, and a growth in uh, international trade of a point of 0.7. Um, and the opening up of ports and market mechanisms that uh, make it possible to speculate uh, on distant resources is not credible. Africa, same as other developing countries, is uh, uh, facing the necessity to activate its uh, assets. And to do that, there's a need for uh, a series of actions. The first uh, objective of the African Union is uh, uh, to set up an infrastructure uh, uh, plan and industrial policy. Where can we get the money? We should not mix it with the uh, problem of debt. Uh, uh, pre- and post-COVID. If we mix these two things, we would get to anti-cyclical policies too early, and that uh, would uh, be counterproductive. If we look at the medium and long term, then it's meaningful. It is quite obvious that in the medium and long term, there will be a need for tax reforms. In the medium and long term terms, international organizations and the African Union will be able to help in that effort because the problem is not only the volume of tax revenue but also the problem of the tool being used to extract those uh, tax revenue but there will be a, a necessity for uh, serious work with international partners on the question of infrastructures the ambassador reminded us of uh, what happened in the last, in the latest TCAD conference. The problem is that we have to make sure that these investments be uh, as efficient as possible. Uh, we do not need only infrastructures; we need quality infrastructure. How can we set up processes that will make it possible? for tax reform and adequate investment to strengthen capacities that have already uh, emerged in Africa. I think international cooperation can, you, can help. And uh, the African Union can go on with the work that's already been started. So there is real possibility uh, 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 in uh, that direction. Uh, the, the problem is how can we make it so that that investment be as effective as possible? How can we define procedures, standards, and if, uh, uh, assessment mechanisms that be effective and that be led by African institutions? That is, to me, the uh, uh, crucial question. Uh, I'll give the floor to the ambassador straight away, but there's a question by a listener that uh, uh, is quite similar. Uh, so what is the debt for? Is it to um, finance uh, consumer goods or to finance infrastructures? That's not the same. Well, in an emerging country, it will, in emerging countries, it will uh, make it possible that African countries do not use uh, the money they have uh, to service the debt, so uh, to free them from the vicious circle of debt. Mr. Ambassador, you have the l last uh, uh, 
few minutes. I totally uh, agree with what Mario said. It's a question of investment. It's not a question of debt. The question is, how do we invest? Mario uh, mentioned that uh, uh, Japan is indebted up to 200 percent of GDP. And that uh, it's a uh, uh, disaster? N no. The, of course, interest rates are very low, even negative. So it is not a heavy burden for the uh, uh, future generations. But what is important is that money was used for investment. So uh, it means that there is trust in the use of these funds. And what is also very important is what you mentioned, Christian, the importance of s mobilizing domestic savings. Well, let me tell you, Africa is not a poor, con a poor continent. It is a very rich continent, not only all that land, but also a lot of arable lands and also human resources. So there's great potential. But why is Africa not well developed? To me, it's a question of how we can mobilize this potential and those domestic resources in Africa. So there is something that doesn't that is not working the system is very rigid there's the question of regu regulation governance co uh, trust fraud predictability so on the surface africa is considered as very risky as a high risk uh country uh for uh, external financing partners but it is worth investing in. We have to invest in those uh, domestic resources. It's very important. There's a question that I haven't mentioned about raw materials that we, uh, several of us mentioned. The question is, how can African countries uh, protect themselves against an unfavorable uh, uh, evolution in uh, uh, raw materials? So there's a uh, possibility of uh, hedging uh, on certain markets, but the drop in raw material prices can be very detrimental for African countries that are already on the racist edge. Carlos probably has uh, things to say about this, but it is quite obvious that natural resources in Africa are a comparative advantage. If you compare how much is invested in mining uh, in uh, 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 Australia and uh, what is ex um, uh, invested in the uh, exploitation of those uh, natural uh, of mining uh, resources in Africa. Of course, a lot more could be done, but it's the dependency on raw materials. Yeah, the lack of diversification. Yes, the problem is how can we build other competitive edges, other competitive advantages in Africa? So uh, the whole economy uh, has been structured in only a few sectors. There has to be more diversification, and diversification criteria have to be set up, and that's for the African Union. There's, there are some African countries that are mono production or sing, on a single production uh, 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 specialization, but that's also true of Russia. Carlos, do you have something to say about raw materials? Just a quick word to concur with what Mario said and maybe to add something. There's one aspect that we should mention. Rating agencies only look at uh, what depends on circumstances and not what is structural. And the problem of raw materials that are not being transformed is a structural problem. So um, if we... Uh, uh, so if uh, we only include what rating agencies uh, want, we will never have the uh, needed uh, investment for transformation. And it is transformation that will enable industrialization. Thank you very much. 
This brings us to the end of this uh, great discussion. Many thanks to our three panelists. Many thanks to our uh, loyal listeners. And many thanks for your questions that have reached me. Uh, and many thanks for following this session, which is certainly not the last of uh, uh, this, uh, these three days, but the last, uh, the last one today. There you have it. Many thanks. Thank you. Have a nice evening.